they added in the second half of the webinar is some of the recent research that's going on about what's happening in, in, in enzyme in the enzyme industry. So first up, let's go back to basics uh, because around this time of year we all need reminders about fermentation and extraction. So there's six points. Uh, first is what are enzymes? What do they do? Uh, second is what are the conditions affecting enzyme activity? Third is the profiles of different enzymatic pre pre preparations, excuse me. Uh, fourth is the pectin structure. We're going to look at what pectins are and what pectinases do. We're going to look at the importance of depectinization. And then we're going to look at what enzyme types are available. I got at the top there, I believe, is Louis Pasteur. Um, so what are enzymes? So we're going to look at a bit of history and some general knowledge about what enzymes are. So they're, they're macromolecules. <clears throat> they're active proteins, uh, and they catalyze a biological reaction. They're highly specific, basically, to the reactions that they catalyze. They do one thing. And they're highly specific to their choice of substrates. So they basically attack one substrate. So enzymes aren't changed or consumed in the reactions. They will speed up the same reaction over and over again. Enzymes are a key part of uh, biological processes. Uh, and they'll just, they'll just keep going until they eventually fade away and die off. So basically, we start up number one there. That's my pointer here. We'll start up here. It's a cycle, basically. It's, uh, this thing just goes around and around and around. Uh, the enzyme attracts the substrate to its active site. Here's all this substrate here in the, in the line. Here's the enzyme itself. It forms an enzyme substrate complex, this one here. Notice how neatly this fits together. Third, it catalyzes a chemical reaction and then changes the products that are formed. You see a difference in colors here. And then, fourth, it allows the products to separate from the enzyme. Off it goes. The enzyme's happy, the products have changed. And then the enzyme's ready for a new cycle and it'll just keep going. So, external conditions influencing the enzymatic reaction. How do, I, how do I judge how well my enzyme is performing in my juice or my wine, right? What's going what's gonna to influence? So, there's, we normally think of the big three, right? Which is temperature, dose, and contact time. And those three are interrelated. If the temperature is warmer, you can use less enzyme and get the same uh, the same contact time. If you allow a long contact time, you can out, you can decrease your dosage. So they all relate to each other. Um, but there is definitely a, a, an impact of pH. But you can see how small that triangle is in the, in the <clears throat> on this side here. This is enzymes in general, right? This side here is enzymes and can be enzymes in the wine in wine, right? Where dose is the primary thing and pH is quite small. Um, so. Higher dose is recommended at lower pH. Dosage increases, speeds up the transformation rate. Increased constant contact time results in a greater quantity of substrates to be transformed. An increase in the temperature results in an increase in the transformation rate. Now, let's go into a few concepts here. Robustness. Excuse me one moment. Um, robustness is the, the way that an enzyme will work in varying environments, okay? Uh, so really we're talking pH, temperature, and alcohol levels. Now let's look at pH. pH is actually, this is why we're kind of thinking more in terms of pH now. There's two enzymes here. These are two Lafort preparations. They're both clarification enzymes for, for white juice, right? 600 XL and XL clarification. They are uh, both purified enzymes. Um, they're both uh, they're both liquid enzymes, but they function very very differently at different pHs, and you can basically pick which one you will use based on your what your uh, pH is going to be. If you're making just sparkling wine, you probably want to go for the 600 XL this guy here because your pH is you know two and a half to three, and it's got much greater activity than the XL clarification. If you're making Chardonnay, right, you can go here. You use the exo clarification. Sorry, I must backtrack. Exo clarification is not purified. They are slightly different. But the key factor here is the, is the pH influence on the uh, on the enzyme performance, right? That's robustness. 
600XL is more robust because it's got that consistent uh, activity profile across all the ranges of pH. The 600XL is robust in terms of pH. All right, activity profiles of various enzymatic preparations. So enzymes are cocktails. There's all sorts of enzymatic activities. I went to, I went, did my undergrad winemaking degree in the, the 1990s, um, and they were just you know pectinases then. That's what we were told. But there's a massive amount of different pectinases are there, and, and there are specific enzymes to break down specific components. Um, so some of the main ones we think about here, uh, polygalacturinase, pectin esterase, and pectinolyase are the three big ones that are pect pectolytic enzymes, right? But then you've got arabinase, galactinase, and ramnogalactiurinase, which are also work on some of the other polysaccharides within jute and wine. So what is, what is pectin? We get this, this, uh, this model here, this is uh, put the laser point here. This model here we have, right, is the most simplistic model. And as we go through this, uh, this presentation, the model gets more and more complicated. Uh, so this one here is, uh, pectin is it's, it's, uh, it basically inhibits clarification. That's what it does. It basically keeps all of your solids suspended in the, in the juice. Um, and what are pectinase is? Well, there's three big ones. I just mentioned those. Uh, polygalacturinase is this guy here. It chops up galacturonic acids that, are, that have no methyl group on them. Pectin methyl esterase, this one here, it'll take out methyl groups. And then pectin lyase will take out, will chop up uh, methylated galacturonic acids. So you can see how the three sort of work together to basically break down the entire pectin change, chain, and that lowers the viscosity and allows your juice to settle. Um, and there's three steps there. Um, when you add your pectinase to your juice after pressing, first you have a, a hydro, uh, flocculation, and that's when the, the soluble pectin hydrolyzes. Then you have a change in the pectin charge, right? and that's when your viscosity will drop. And then you have electrostatic attraction, and that's when you can either rack if you allow static settling, cold settling, or you allow it to you inject nitrogen and float the juice up to the top. Like I said, it gets a little more complicated as we go through through the presentation. This is a great model of uh, this is one of the many images of, of, uh, of the great cells and the cell walls. So pectins are in the cell walls themselves. Okay, so the vacuole, this is this bit here in the middle of the cell. Right, this is a great cell. Um, that's what your good stuff is: the juice, the sugar, the anthocyanins. Okay, and the protopectin hydrolysis facilitates access to this vacuole. You're basically going to break down this cell wall. And here's the cell wall here, which is a little microcosm, little slice of this cell wall here. You want to break down this structure here to get access to that vacuole in the middle of the, the cell. Okay, so pectin structure is a bit of an example of a pectin there. Pectins, you find them in apples a lot. Um, big deal in apples. Pectin, if you've ever made jams or jellies, you need pectin to actually set the jams or jellies. Um, but in general, in winemaking, you want to remove the pectin. So, like I said, it gets a little more complicated. This, um, this guy here, this structure here we're looking at is uh, uh, we're looking at different actions of polygalacturinase. Okay, so there's two, two activities. Um, there's the endo and the exo. The exo enzymes, I'll chop off here. They'll just basically work from the ends and work their way in, breaking down those galacturonic acids. The endo exomes, these guys in the middle, they'll just work in the middle and they'll chop up big chunks. Okay, and they'll, they'll form oligomers. Excuse the French. It's a, it's a French slide. Um, but the good thing about French technical writing is that it's pretty much the same words as they are in English. Okay, a little more complicated. Side chains. These are the extra bits and pieces that are attached to pectins. It's not life would be great if it was just one simple chain that we break down. This is actually these are side chains. Um, so we've got pectin lyase, we've got, we've got pectin lyase here, you know where that breaks down there, the methylated pectin groups. You've got pectin methyl esterase, which chops off methylated groups. 
you've got polyglac urinase, which chops up the basic, the demethylated function. And then you've got all these guys here. Oh, side chains. So what you need to get these off is specific enzymes again. This is a rhamnogalacturinase 2 molecule. So you need rhamnogalacturinase, sorry, it's a rhamnogalacturin molecule. You need rhamnogalacturinase to break it off. This is an arabin, so you need an arabinase. Uh, you need this one here is an arabin, another arabin, so you need another arabinase here. And that's actually going to get you your full, you call them the hairy side region. So that helps you depectinize fully. Um, so when we make enzymes, so there's two aspects here. One is grape pectins are very complex, but the other one is grape uh, uh, enzymes. The enzymes we use to depectinize are very complex also. So basically you ferment Aspergillus niger or Aspergillus peculiatus, uh, and the byproducts they produce are the enzymes. And you can change the conditions of fermentation to get different uh, byproducts performed. Think of it like, uh, basically like yeast fermentations to get different flavors, right? Um, so pectins are proteins produced by microorganisms, which are catalysts of chemical reactions. Specifics to the substrates, directly related to these factors, and the filamentaceous fungi, the Aspergillus species, produce a broad range of lytic enzymes. Uh, all these also, um, I should add there, uh, the, the, the Trichoderma hasianum produces gluconase. I'll touch a little bit on gluconase at the very end of the presentation. But you can see there how the different, uh, so Aspergillus niger versus Aspergillus aculeatus. Aculeatus produces a lot more of the polygalacturinase and less of pectin lyase and pectin methyl esterase. So basically, you can target your enzyme cocktail to your specific uh, situations. No, you're not actually expected to do that yourself. That's why we're here, because we can actually work through and say, you know, use, this is why we say you use this enzyme for this application and this enzyme for that application. Here's an, here's an example of strains within. It gets, yeah, I love this. It gets more complicated. Uh, strains within uh, the species of Aspergillus aculeatus. Again, just like winemaking yeasts, you have different strains. Um, so the one on the left, number one, versus the one on the right, number two, uh, the top eight activities are around 70, well, 76, 72% in both of them. And the rest of the activities are around 24 to 28%. But they have a very different uh, breakdown of what activity the thing has. And if you think back to that the drawing of the pectolytic chain, you know that if you've got different chains, you will need to use different enzyme strains. There's another way of making enzymes. Uh, well, oh, it's kind of another way. Uh, this is the, the self-cloned enzyme. Uh, so basically, you can you can genetically modify Aspergillus niger or Aspergillus aculeatus to produce just a certain a very small range of enzymes. If you just want one particular enzyme, you go, you, you basically genetically modify this uh, speed, this strain, and then you you basically grow enzymes. Uh, and you can see here, you've got a whole bunch of, you've got 70% of one specific activity, but, and there's only five activities in total. So this is cool if your substrate is homogenous, if you've got all the same stuff. Sometimes in winemaking that's true, sometimes it's not true. Um, now, a little side note on this, uh, they are the organism is genetically modified. The enzyme in the U.S. is not considered genetically modified. So they are legal for use in, in winemaking in the U.S. The only other country in the world like that is Germany. Uh, in the rest of the world, they're considered, the, en the enzymes themselves are considered genetically modified. But they're very simple. And they're, very, they're simple and they're efficient for a very unique, specific circumstance. But my life is not that simple, so there's a lot more going on. Um, boost enzyme. All right, so this is uh, this is what happens after you use that that former one, the, uh, the the genetically modified material. There are a lot of situations where you'll get a, uh, a wine that just won't depectinize. Doesn't matter how much of the pectolytic enzyme you add, there's something in there holding it back from depectinizing, and it's normally a specific set of side chains or some specific uh, main parts of the chain, which the, the enzyme you're using is not breaking down. So there does exist a boost enzyme, uh, which is 
really rich inside activity. It just does a whole lot of you know, all the little individual things. Uh, and by break clearing away the side activities, you're really trying to get um, allowing the pectin lyase and the polyglate urinase access to the to the main chain. Okay, so it's, it's a boosting boost enzymes are more of a complement to your existing enzyme formulation. Okay, purified enzymes. I'm going to touch on that too. We're actually timing wise, we're doing pretty well. We should get through the basics in the first half of the presentation, and then we'll come back and. We'll get into the, the recent work. Uh, purified enzymes, so there is a property of one of the side activities is cinnamoyl esterase. It's produced by Aspergillus niger. Uh, you actually don't want cinnamoyl esterase activity because it forms volatile phenols, right? Um, so if we follow, I mean, I can follow, you know what, I'm gonna spare you the molecular thing, but it does two things. One is it produces vinyl phenols directly. Uh, the other one, it's, uh, the vinyl phenols are the substrate for uh, producing the ethyl phenols, ethyl glycol, et cetera, which are the by using Britannomyces. So basically, if you have an enzyme that's not purified, you can end up with a lot of vinyl phenols in whites. And in reds, you'll have a lot of vinyl phenols, which could be metabolized by Britannomyces into uh, ethyl phenol, ethyl glycol, et cetera. Um, but that, that's the whole reason for using purified enzymes. I did taste a wine once that had a lot of vinyl phenol in it. Um, I bought it, it was a large producer, um, and I bought it, it was a 2014 Sauvignon Blanc, I think I bought it in 2017, and I was like, well, I'll give it a shot, I'll see what it tastes like. And uh, it just smelled like a swimming pool. I was like, oh, okay, realization here, that's, that's vinyl phenol, so it's definitely something you don't want in your, in your, uh, in your wines. Oops, I think I just dumped a slide there. Okay. So the importance of complete depectinization as opposed to partial, right? So getting a negative pectin test, right? The pectin test is pretty straightforward. You just, it's just uh, juice and acidified ethanol. Wait a couple of minutes. If there's flakes, there's pectin. Um, now, complete hydrolysis will make your pre-ferment clarification much quicker, much more efficient. Um, It'll also make your post-fermentation clarification and filtration much more effective. Right? And ideally, your pectin hydrolysis should happen before ethanol concentration rises, so before fermentation. Um, so what happens is that the pectin chain will sort of wrap up into little balls um, when in the presence of alcohol, and they're much harder to depectinize. The pectinolytic enzymes will still work in alcohol, but they won't be able to access the, uh, they won't die. They won't, be, they won't be able to access the, the pectin compounds to break them down. So get your juice to pectin nice up front. So here we go. The pectin test. It's an alcohol test. You basically tube, acidified ethanol, wait a few minutes. Um, the clarification test, which is what you see here, this guy here, is basically you use a graduated cylinders and a lamp, and you basically just look through and see how clear your wine is. You can measure the turbidity as well, or you can just look through it visually. Um, and there's a filterability test too, which is a little more complex. It's basically the amount of juice that will get filtered under a certain pressure in a given amount of time. Uh, so there's, there's lots of tests you can do to make sure you are depectinized so that you then move on to you know, the rest of your winemaking. Um, so remember, okay, the enzymatic activity comparisons, right? That's where it gets a little complicated. Um, so enzymes, enzymes are a cocktail of different activities. They're produced through different microbes, different strains. We actually, um, we blend together different uh, fermentations of Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus aculeatus, right, to make our specific enzymes. So we'll have one fermentation where we get a lot of this property, but we want some more of this particular activity, so we'll blend them together. Right. The thing you'll see, though, um, on all of this safety data sheets or the product data sheets, is it, it kind of reduces all that activity to a single number. Right? Like, and it's normally polygalactic urinase activity. Right? That's, it's not really the full, it's not, really, it's not at all the full story of what is going on. You kind of need to do seller trials to find out what's happening. And you need to assess the variability, your grape variety, 
for example, Muscat presents a lot more settling problems than do, does other varieties. Uh, vintage differences, ripening differences, soundness of the grapes, and the specificity of the formulations. So what I did, make things easier, I went through the Lafort data to give you an idea of um, you know, comparisons, okay? So the first three are uh, our, red, our main three red wine enzymes, and we're gonna talk about this at the second half of the presentation, right? So this is the listed activity, it's polygalactourinase units per gram, right? And then also you can look on the safety data sheets we have, this is all published, um, as to how much enzyme there is by weight. And you look at it, it's like, well, Lafar's fruit has got 6,700 units, which is almost double what XL extraction has, right? But the enzyme by weight is a lot less, okay? That's the, the first three reds. Second set are uh, white clarification enzymes. Um, again, huge variability in you know, the measurement of polygalactyrinase, right? And again, a big measurement of the difference in the percentage enzymes by weight in the, in the enzyme package you, you purchase. So that these numbers, you know, they're, they're interesting, but they're not what it's all about. You need to do seller trials to really figure out what enzyme suits your process. Um, I did actually take a quick look as well. I just refer to my notes down here. Um, of all these six, uh, they are all but 600 XL are blends of Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus aculeatus. Okay, 600 XL is just fermented with Aspergillus uh, niger. So that's that's part of the blending process. There are different, different ferments within each species and different strains within each species, and then 600XL is just one species. Do trials. That's my, that's my one thing for enzymes, is just do trials. Just, well, actually, winemaking in general. See what happens. Measure, measure what happens and then make decisions after that. So pectinases for white winemaking, it's just a, a couple of pages here on you know, what you, how you would choose stuff. Uh, if you want to extract, this is basically uh, flavor enhancement. Right? You can use lafazyme extract, XL extraction. Uh, lafazyme is extract is purified, XL extraction is not. Uh, there are pressing enzymes. These are four different four different places you would use enzymes, and there are different formulations for these particular things. Right? Uh, pressing enzymes, lafazyme press, Lafaz XL press. Uh, that's basically to increase the efficiency of your pressing. It's not going to get different flavors out, but it's going to get you more free run and press at a lower pressure to get the same yield. Uh, there's also clarification enzymes. That's, I mean, originally that was my thought. That's probably the biggest use in the globally. Um, they depectinize. They're adapted to flotation or static settling. Um, you want to get them dialed in for least, efficient lease compaction or efficient flotation. Um, and then they also preserve some of the polysaccharides. We're gonna talk about polysaccharides in the next half of the presentation. And there's also uh, enzymes blends for challenging clarifications, the boost, boost enzyme. There's different reasons you would use enzymes. Enzymes for red wine making, same deal here. We have a bunch of different, uh, we have three, we're gonna look at three specific ones. If you wanna maximize your color and tannin extract and mouthfeel, like the, the, the big red, especially Bordeaux-style wines. Lafarge Atrium Grand Cru is, is excellent. Um, I started, I was using that well before I came to Lafarge. I think about, I think almost 15, 20 years ago, I started using Atrium Grand Cru for, um, for making Cabernet Sauvignon. So it works super well. Um, fruitiness clarification, Lafarge fruit is the way to go there. Very different enzyme used also for reds, but you know, for like Pinot Noir, for more fresh, elegant style wines. Uh, and for yield enhancement, Lafarge's XL extraction. That's designed basically to get the juice out of the skins. Right? If you want to go for a 170, 180 gallons per ton, that's that's the one to go for. Right? Also, it's also much faster. So if you have a short turnaround time in your uh, in your tank, like five, six, seven days, XL extraction will get the juice out and the color out much faster. That's it. Like I said, that was a very basic summary, um, and it was pretty quick too, I must say. Uh, you're welcome to have more questions. I see there is actually a question there already, but I'll come back to the question, okay? So I'm not ignoring that question that's there. Um, what I'll do now is I'll talk a little bit about um, 
some recent work we're doing, uh, two, two different projects. One is uh, on grape cell walls, and that's a Lafort sponsored PhD in collaboration with the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and two is file enhancing enzymes. I don't think I spelled Stellenbosch correctly there. Um, all right, so first up, uh, grape cell walls, what's going on there? So just to give you an idea of what's going on here, uh, it's based on the work of uh, John Moore, who's at the university uh, professor there. Uh, this is an article in 2014. If you're interested in this, um, Google John Moore grape cell walls, and there's actually an article published online, I just found this a couple of weeks ago, um, on a, which goes into a lot more depth about his enzyme research. So it's going to look at the, we're going to, we are going to look at the current knowledge of the cell wall. Uh, we're going to look at this new study to understand the cell wall of red grapes. And we're going to look at how cell walls are degraded and the extraction mechanisms under winemaking parameters, right? and it's specifically by using enzymes. And there's a, there's a tool here at the top. It's a comprehensive microarray polymer profiling. We'll take a, we'll take a, little, a little look at that. So, Go back in time a little bit. 1980s, we discovered the pectin compounds. I mean, a lot of winemaking knowledge is pretty pretty recent. Um, uh, Ar Arubino, arabinogalactins were characterized, so the AGPs. Um, in the 1990s, there was a we, we discovered the link between ripening and the composition of the cell walls and grapes. They change basically, uh, and that was looking at this, the polysaccharides in the skin and how it changed, and also microscopic studies of the cell wall during the run. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we started to quantify and elucidate the properties of all the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides, to me, is one of those great buzzwords in the in the wine industry. You know, it, it can be used for good things, for stuck pectin wines, or it could be, sorry, bad things, pectin stuck. Uh, or good things like giving extra mouth uh, And then also looking at uh, just about 10, 15 years ago, the role of enzymatic preparations in the composition of the great berry cell walls and the interactions with phenolics. Uh, so this one we're looking at, go back up to the top there, to the top, goals, studying the great cell wall deconstruction in Cabernet during ripening to get a model of great berries, cell walls. I said, this gets a little more complicated. These cell wall diagrams get more complicated. Um, uh, do I really want to describe every single thing to you? No, I don't. Um, but basically, what you've got here is your cell wall. It's a plant cell wall. There's cellulose, which is the fiber stuff, right? There's hemicellulose, xyloglucans. These are polysaccharides. They're all polysaccharides. Hemicellulose. Then there's the homogalactirinins and the ranogalactirinins. They're the things that they're the pectins, right? And the pectins can be uh, cross-linked with calcium. They can be methylosterified, non-methylosterified. They can be stuck to ramnogalactirins, either uh, galactins and arabins, ramnogalactirin-1, or with boron diesters. So there's a whole bunch of uh, interest there. Why should I tell about all of these different molecules? Well, some of them are really important. Some of them are less so. Ramnogalactirin-2 is the one that's implicated in bonding with, binding with tannins and increasing mouthfeel. It's actually a pretty useful uh, compound we'd want to extract. So we'll shrink that down a little bit here. Um, so previous work uh, has really looked at uh, what happens in wine, right? So basically they were looking at uh, the polysaccharides in the grape cell wall, doing alcoholic fermentation, acid hydrolysis, and ending up with all of these monosaccharides, basically breaking down the polys into monos, right? Um, what happened with this study was a, a, a different take on it, which was um, looking at it in grapes, not in wine. Right? Different, different way of looking at things. So this, this enormous chessboard is what I think of when I see this. This guy here is a microscope slide, and on top of it you put one of these microarrays, right? And then each of these little squares here is one of these fantastic chess. Uh, set. Um, and what it does is it, it uh, there's a specific antibody, I think 
did I keep there? I did keep this slide in. There are specific antibodies that will bind with specific uh, monosaccharides. So what you end up doing is you make this little tree here. It's your carbohydrate microarray. And the antibodies will stick to the specific um, uh, monosaccharides there. This is done, this uh, was a technique developed at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and then you can map what's in the cell wall. Uh, you can start to, you look at the, what they call the vines here. Um, you actually take these slides with their uh, little trees with the antibodies and the monosaccharides. Excuse me, I'm putting my hand in front of my mouth. Um, and then you can extract them. So here we have two, two uh, solvent extractions. We have sodium hydroxide and CDTA. And you get different amounts of different monomers or different monosaccharides from the different families, the pectins, hemicellulose, the cellulose, and the glycoproteins, with first different uh, antibodies combinations and second different solvents. So you can kind of get an idea of what happens during ripening. That was the idea of this, right? So, and you have to break down all of these compounds and different, different solvents, right? But what we have here is that we found that pectin levels decrease uh, during, this is actually during, this, this one is during fermentation, right? Pectin levels decrease during fermentation, something goes on. And the hemi hemicellulose increases during fermentation. That's the extraction from the uh, extraction of hemicellulose from the from the skins, the cell walls, and the decrease in the pectin breakdown during the fermentation. But it's not complete pectin breakdown, which is interesting. So we wanted to know, and I think this is of more interest specifically for Lafort. Um, uh, I see another question, and I have an answer to that question as well. I'll come back to it. Um, so the study was, okay, so how do we differentiate our enzymes? Like we know in the field how they work because we develop them to do different things, and all of the feedback from, from winemakers is, well, this enzyme does this, and this one does that. So basically we set up a randomized trial. Um, this is part of it. Um, and this is uh, looking at three different ripeness levels with a control and then uh, the Lafarge fruit, H.E. Grand Cru, and XL extraction. We basically wanted to see what enzyme effects there were, three different ripening levels, three different enzyme preparations, what, effect, what effects there were on the cell wall when the compounds released. It's not that bad. It may look bad, but it's not that bad. Um, so this is a, a concept called principal component analysis, because as you can imagine, let's go back on the slide, we're going to measure every single monosaccharide out there, right, with all of these trials and all these things. So then you basically crunch all the data together and you get a principal component analysis. And what it does is it gives you, instead of like an X and a Y axis, you know, time and you know, bricks or whatever, which you use all the time, right, you've got the, in this case, the X axis is the principal component one. So that's 51% of the variability. And the y-axis is principal component two, which is 10% of the variability. And you can break down, and then you can plot where the different compounds are. For example, over here, on the right-hand side of the x-axis, that's where you find the Rg1s, the arabinins, the galactins, the homogalactins. They're the unbroken down, the, the more polysaccharides. And over here on the left, you've got the xylans, the manins, and the cellulose, which is the broken down compounds. Uh, so this, the x-axis is kind of looking at depectinization. Um, and then the y-axis is kind of not only looking at deesterification. So you can see a nice clean break here. This big green lot here, this is your untreated fruit. There's no, there's, there's pectin there, right? So all of those compounds are still, um, all the, the larger compounds are still there. And then the left-hand side, you can see a slight, you know, it kind of differentiates. You've got up the top left, you've got XL extraction. And down the bottom left, you've got Lafarge fruit. And across in all of this area, you've got Lafarge HE Grand Cru. So you're kind of seeing the differentiation of how they work. Oh, I should say, this one is uh, this micropolymer array, and it's what's dissolved in the CDTA fraction. There's another slide which is dissolved in the sodium hydroxide fraction. All right. So it does reduce your variation. So I'll just go through the bullet points here. It reduces your variation um, using any enzyme, right? Well, enzymes will, 
will break down the pectin, that's easy. But then there's this differentiation vertically showing the white activities of HE chromal cru, the deesterification of fruit, and the fact that the untreated samples are not equivalent to the treated ones. Then the next slide, is basically it's looking at the fraction that was dissolved in sodium hydroxide. But again, you get this really nice differentiation um, and you can, you can put, you know, you can put in the different compounds here, right? So we've got the Rg1s, Hgs, the different compounds here, the breakdown products here, right? Nice, neat breakdown here of the uh, nice, neat clustering of the untreated controls. And then again, you've got this nice differentiation. You've got on the kind of left-hand side there, XL extraction. On the right-hand side, you've got fruit. And throughout, you've got the Hg wrong crew, which means that you've got, you're getting different extraction profiles, different monomers, different monosaccharides are coming out of the wine after the pectolytic activity. It's funny, this is one of those research projects where we know taste-wise what happens, now we're trying to figure out what happens chemically. So we're kind of developing this, well, there's the, there's the old model of the cell wall, okay? So we're developing a new model, and it's really, it's including this thing here. Let's put a, we'll put a circle around this thing here. This thing, whoa, that's a really fat line. Sorry about that. That thing there, this is the the pectin layer. Right? So we're, we've got three layers now. We, we, we know, that's really big, that thing. I'll take that away. Uh, we know, oops, here is the cell wall, right? Lots of cellulose, xyloglucans, et cetera. Here's the, the pulp. That's much more easily broken down by fermentation to release all the contents of the vacuoles. And this is your pectin-rich layer. So there are different compounds there. We're trying to figure out what we have to break down to extract maximally to get the flavor and color and texture out of our wines. And as you can go from uh, right to left here, the pulp tends to, this, this inner layer tends to break down. You can taste, when you taste grapes in the vineyard, you see that the inner layer breaks down. That's the pectin-rich layer there. Uh, why use red enzymes? Well, why would you use red enzymes? Well, basically what we're seeing here is we're showing that different enzyme formulations do different things in, uh, in red wine fermentation in grapes. They do different things to the grapes themselves, right? Uh, so taking the wine thing out of the, uh, entirely out of the equation. Um, they'll all reduce the variability present at different ripeness levels. Um, they'll all extract positive cell wall compounds. Uh, the also improve depectinization time, which does improve your filtration down the track. Uh, and there's a significant difference in wine flavor profile. That's where it becomes like a stylistic contribution. You know, Lafarge Atri Grand Cru is a style, whereas, uh, and, and not whereas, Lafarge Atri Grand Cru is a style choice. Lafarge Fruit is a style. That's where you get to play with different things in, in your wine. Um, so there's three, I got three, one, two, three reasons here for using enzymes. Um, if you're really going for big structured red wines, right? You want a lot of phenolics and you want a lot of polysaccharides, you want a lot of mouthfeel and volume on the, on the, with the assumption that your, your wine will, will do this, right? Um, that's when you're gonna go HE Grand Cru. It's got a broad spectrum of action. It'll bring out a lot of that RG2. It'll also bring out a lot of uh, cellulase and hemicellulase. It's got a lot, of, a lot of that activity, so it'll boost up the structure too. Uh, if you're going for a sweet extraction, right? It's just sweet, fruity, aromatic, like fresh, fruit-driven wine, shorter fermentations, right? Shorter maceration. That's when you want to go to Lafarge Fruit. Actually, sorry, I, I took these brand names out because I presented this to another winery and they said, no, no, we don't want brand names. So, okay, fine. Um, so Lafarge Atrium Grand Cru is the first one. Lafarge Fruit is the middle one. The bottom one, the bottom one is um, XL Extraction. And that's really if you want just to get extraction. You want to hurry the process up, Short macerations, you know, four to seven days. You want to turn your tanks over quickly, much deeper. It's, it's quick and effective. Right? Yeah, we're moving along. Okay, so that's that's the summation of the red wine work. Okay, is the why? Go back there. Why you would use and how you would use these different enzymes. Now we're going to go into a little kind of detour here. Uh, file enhancing enzymes. Files are the uh, 
the aromatic compounds, you know, they're found in so many plants. Um, like, so uh, passion fruits, uh, grapefruit, um, boxwood, grassiness, um, those kinds of, they're all thiols, right? Um, there's lots of tools to enhance thiols. You also get thiols, um, a lot of Provence rosés have a lot of thiols. Um, they use a lot of techniques to really enhance the thiols. There's very small amounts in Grenache and Carignan, et cetera. But if you use different techniques to enhance thiols, you can get super aromatic ones. So this is one of those techniques. This I'm going to really, I'm not going to describe this, but what I am going to say is a lot of this work is, again, pretty recent. Um, we figured out back in the late 90s how the precursor of uh, 3SH, the, the passion fruit aroma, was formed. But then it took another uh, 13, no, 15, 16 years to get from the great precursor all through the different steps to learn you know, the process of getting to the aromatic compound. It's not just a simple turn a switch and away you go. It's, there's a whole lot of enzymatic biochemical steps in it. There's all these three SH precursors, and then at the very end, there's a thiol. So this is looking at, um, uh, this is a little complicated. It goes clockwise, starting top left. This is the, the kinetics of the activity of these particular uh, precursors to the next precursor in the line. And it's using a control on three different enzyme formulations. And what we're seeing is that with enzymes, specifically pectolytic enzymes, you see changes in the rate of formation of all these. And they, they decrease because you know, this, this, the first precursor will go down because then the next precursor will come along and go down and the next precursor will go down. Right? So we're seeing a lot of this biotransformation process. Um, step by step. And it's happening with enzymes. Um, all we really know is that the, the enzyme preparation improves the biotransformation rate of the thiol precursors, right? We're not exactly sure how, but we know it works. We, we totally validated it and tested it, right? That's the enzyme works on the precursors. The last step which is the step of turning the precursors into the aromatic itself, that requires a yeast. So this, this uh, using a thiol-releasing enzyme, you need a thiol-releasing yeast to capitalize on all of these precursors that are there to basically take them into aromatic compounds. Um, so this is Lapazine Thiols Plus. This is, uh, this is your uh, thiol-releasing enzyme. So it's, it's a cocktail, again, uh, rich in very specific secondary activities. And what it does, it releases, this is a, this is a key point here. Um, it works on increasing the amount of precursors in the juice that are available for conversion by the yeast, specifically of 3SH and A3SH, which is your tropical grapefruit, uh, passion fruit, those kinds of aromas. Doesn't do much for the boxwood and the grassy aromas. So it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a style, it's a, again, it's a style tool. Right? It's gonna lift up your aromatics with a, yeah, passion fruit and grapefruit and so forth. Um, so we, the hypothesis here is that uh, there's a synergistic activity with the yeast, right, which increases the, also could increase the yeast style metabolism. All right, so you've got three things you've got to do there. Oops, three things. Choose a strain which can release and convert thiols. Right, that's important. Um, you can use nitrogen nutrition to enhance your thiol production. And you still, you still require aromatic protection. You still need to take care of those thiol. Thiols are quite susceptible to, uh, to oxidation. So there's, there's that. So we are actually getting close to the end, which is good for timing because there's a few, there's a few more minutes for questions. Um, so what do we got? Uh, this is some application data. Um, when do I use it? This is always good questions. Great to know these products are out there, but the key thing is when do I use this? When do I use it? How do I use it? Uh, so this is looking at some data, as in adding it uh, the control with no no addition, and then either adding it after settling or at the first third of alcoholic fermentation. There's actually in terms of statistic difference, um, the do, 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 the second two aren't statistically different, but they're both different from the first one. They're both different from the control. Uh, and a, a note on the scale here on the y-axis, uh, what we do when we report our thiols, because there's a huge disparity in, in uh, quantities found in wine, there's like the 
it's a 10 to the 3 of, uh, I think, 3 and 3 of 4 MMP and like 10 to the 1 of, well, 0.1 of uh, 3MH. So what we do is we take the, the, uh, the sensory threshold and divide it by the quantity found. So if the number is 1, that means that we found the amount that is the sensory threshold. And if there's 2, there's twice as much as the sensory threshold. And we just use that data. So it's the aromatic intensity, right? So here we're looking at um, 3MH. The control is 6.7, so six, almost seven times the threshold perception. But then you jump up to 8, 8 and a half, 8.3 to 8.8 .8 of the uh, threshold perception with the thiol enzyme uh, using either uh, either addition strategy, either post-settling or during fermentation. So you've got a lot of flexibility there. It's not a settling enzyme. It's something you want to add after settling, up to the first third of fermentation. There's no, there's no point adding it after the first third of fermentation because then the yeast have less time to transform those precursors into thiols and stuff. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Possible uses. There's a couple of strong uses, right? Uh, whites for sure, Sauvignon Blanc, Colombard, Mensang, Petit Mensang, and Gross Mensang. Um, I think Petit Mensang is one of those varieties that was just legalized for use in Bordeaux in tiny quantities. Because of a dramatic change in Bordeaux winemaking, they allowed another grape variety in. Uh, Muscadet, Malon de Bourgogne, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can use it in reds, true, true. Uh, Rosés, it's really good, though. Um, not so much for the entry level, um, the, the bag and box stuff or the, the simple wines. More for your mid-range and your high-end bottles. Uh, so uh, we have fairly good presence in Provence, and we know that there's a lot of file enhancing enzymes used in Provence because that's what they're, they're going for more and more and more aromatic wines. Um, oh, I see there's a, on the bubble on the right-hand side here, there's this favorite word here, stabulation. Um, interesting that we would phrase this for wineries not using stabulation. Uh, so stabulation is the process of pressing rosé, fruit, leaving the juice on the juice lees and stirring that for up to a week, two weeks, at a cold temperature, then racking and fermenting. That also enhances styles. If you can't do that, or you've got, you've got tank crunches or whatever, or you can't cool it down adequately, then this is a good substitute for stabulation. Um, but it's not, it's not the same process. Yeah. What else we got? So, red, so whites, aromatic whites and rosés are two, 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 key, uh, two key varieties. Oh, but there's more to enzymes than this. There's, 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 there's way more to enzymes in industry. Um, there's beta glucosidase enzymes. They release terpenes. They get used in wine. That's another topic entirely. Um, and then there is um, beta glucanase, which is uh, aids in beta breaking down glucans uh, and it breaks down yeast cells as well, dead yeast cells. So you can accelerate lees or you can uh, aid filtration with that. And there's also microbial control, which is lysozyme, which is derived from egg whites. So, I mean, I haven't even touched those. They're, they're worthy of a presentation in themselves. But really what we've looked at is um, the, the key factors. Oops, what's going on? Where's my, where's my last slide? I can't change my slides anymore. I've run out of slides. Um, there's supposed to be a wrap up, okay? I'm going to have to open up another slide here um, to give you the final slides. Um, basically, uh, we, what we've looked at is the start of the presentation, the first half, was the basics of how to use enzymes, right, the, uh, for settling and for extraction, and how enzymes work in terms of dose rate, temperature, and time, and pH. And then we looked at more recent work after that, which is the uh, you know, differentiating enzymes based on actual measurable performance in a, site, in a laboratory setting, rather than what we have previously, which is we know that this enzyme gives this style and this enzyme. Bear with me one moment. I'm a little uh, uh, a little shocked. I don't have my final uh, I don't have my final slide here. Let's just open it up. Hang in there two seconds. Let's see how fast I can do this without. Uh, without making it too boring for the audience. You can now is a great time to think of questions. You can. Write them in the chat feature, or you can send them direct to the host. Up to you. Um, 
Okay. Just opening up the PowerPoint file now. So, you know what, I'm just going to call it there. I'm going to do the questions now because the next slide is really, looks like the same as the first slide. It looks like this. Okay. Questions. I see some questions coming up. Um, I see a few questions popping up. Let's see how I can do this. So let's see how we do this. So, okay, so first question. Um, if you do not clarify for pectin, will the finished wine have more yeast suspended in it compared to a wine with the pectin removed? Whoa, this is the best part for me. I love this question. Um, that's a good question. Uh, possibly yes. I would, I would say yes. It will be harder to settle that wine because the pectin is in there, is still dissolved in the wine, which may attract yeast to it, or as, even as it actually uh, changes its form during fermentation with alcohol, it may actually trap some yeast particles. So yes, you will have slightly more yeast suspended in it compared to a, a wine with the pectin removed. Um, yes to that one. Uh, that was, I think, was the first question. Second question here. Um, I've heard cellulose or cellulase is to be kept away from use on berry wines because it will dissolve the skins and create a sludge. Is that correct? Yes. Um, cellulase will make a huge mess of your, uh, of your wine. Follow the dose rates for sure. Um, I don't have personal experience with berry wines. Um, but yes, I would be extremely judicious in using wine. Uh, using enzyme preparations with cellulase. So for example, HE Grand Cru, it has cellulase and hemicellulase. I have seen the results of people using you know, like five to 10 times the dose rate recommended and you end up with a soup at the end of the crush. Um, so definitely be very wary of that. Uh, that's, that's really with HE Grand Cru. Um, most, I think most catalogs will describe the activities of enzymes. Um, pretty well and go by, go by what you read. But also don't hesitate to reach out to your local person, um, your local representative and you know, ask, you know, I've got this application, I need this, I want to do this, which enzyme should I use and what should I be worried about? Um, so yes, it's a problem. You can definitely make sludge, you can make soup out of, with enzymes. That, that's, that's terrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> so next question. Um, what do I got here? I've got, uh, Will enzymes become inhibited if there is a lot of SO2 present? Uh, generally not. Um, the only caution we, we say there is, and it sounds funny when you say it, but don't mix your SO2 with your enzymes and then add it to your crusher, right? Sometimes that can be a little, seem like a little easier, but that, that's the only time, I mean, the, you, you may have an issue if say you've got, uh, it's, it's, your, it's your fruit processing and you've got a guy person who's like adding you know, a scoop full of uh, enzyme to the must line, then a scoop full of SO2 at the same time. That would be risky, uh, but you need, you need massive amounts of SO2 to uh, inhibit enzyme activity. So as long as you're not adding them at the same time or in the same vessel, as in same pitcher, right, um, then you can totally add SO2 and, uh, and enzymes at the, at the same, to the same tank. Uh, what do we got here? I got another question up here. Um, do, 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 do. A finished Pinot Noir, which sitting in barrels without stirring remains lightly cloudy, even a few centimeters below the surface. Okay, that's really annoying. Yes. Problem could be the result of bacteria activity and a somewhat elevated VA, 0.9. Okay. What enzyme would help settle clarify? Well, that's actually, that's, um, that's a good question. Uh, there's two, two options there. Um, it's probably going to be glucan, um, but the way you would process this is first is you can do a pectin test, right? I, just, I mean, I just send me a note, or send Sky a note, and uh, we'll give you the protocol for the pectin test. 
That way you can see if there's pectins present. Right? And if there's pectins present, then a pectin may be what you want to do it. The pectin test is super easy. Um, the glucan test is much more complex. So you start with a pectin test, run that. If it's not pectins, it's glucans. That's your two options. If it's glucans, you use a beta glucanase enzyme. Uh, so we have one um, extra lyse. That's the one I mentioned earlier, which is a it can be two things. One is it's good for filtration, uh, and one is it's good for breaking down yeast cell walls. So in that case, the other thing I would ask about that is was there any botrytis going on? Because um, we do find that it, well, any wines that have a lot of botrytis in them, the botrytis tends to release a lot of glucans into the wine. And those glucans are the things that will block up your filter and in this case, keep your, uh, keep your haze in the wine. Um, so you can use uh, beta glucanase to, to break down in the case of botrytis. Now, just a little extra bit on botrytis, um, uh, an extra bit on beta glucanase. It actually works best on juice. So if you have, you know, really botrytis uh, pinot coming in, you might want to just add a small dose of beta glucanase up front, just to kind of help break down those glucans straight away. That's a, that's an option. Or you can wait until see if you have filtration problems. Um, let me see. So that's that's the four questions I have. 